Welcome, I'm Darren Dufresne. I'm the director of the writing program here at Wichita State and associate professor of English. And uh, with me is uh, Ari Kaplan, one of the most difficult people to introduce that <laughs> I've ever encountered. Let me, let me start by describing you as an author, an artist, a humorist, an educator, a historian. And because you've been so successful um, at all of these things, it, it, it really doesn't uh, do you justice. Um, it's also really apropos of uh, Ari's visit with us today that he is sponsored by the Departments of History and English, the Elliott School of Communication, University Libraries and the Library Associates, the Media Resource Center, the Ulrich Museum of Art, and the Phi Alpha Theta Gamma Rho Chapter. Uh, Ari has written everything from scripts for Superman, Archie Andrews, Speed Racer, Bart Simpson, SpongeBob, to video games for characters like Dr. Gregory House, He's written humor for a wide range of publications, including Mad Magazine, um, comics for Looney Tunes, Tales from the Crypt, Ben 10, and in his spare time, uh, has also authored many, many historical and popular culture books. Among the most well-known of those books is from Krakow to Krypton, Jews and Comic Books, which was a 2008 National Jewish Book Award finalist, and a 2009 Sophie Brody Honor Book. This is awarded by the American Library Association. And as he describes it, he's literally, quote, written nonfiction books on everything from the life of Vlad the Impaler to the history of pop music. So first of all, thank you for coming to Wichita and Wichita State, and welcome. Thanks for having me. And um, I wonder if we could start a little bit on your background personally. Um, has your interest in comics and humor been a case of finding something that you love to do so that you never have to work a day in your life, even though you're clearly one of the hardest people, <laughs> hardest working people that I've, I know of, or were there specific people or events that channeled your talents in these directions? Uh, a little bit of both. I mean, yeah, it certainly is a case of like de trying to design a life for myself where I get to do what I love and do it for a living, get paid for it, and, you know, and um, to, to make it sound crass, uh, you know, where I get to do what I love professionally and it's a lot of fun and it's incredibly creatively gratifying. For example, I'm working on a couple of Lego Star Wars books right now for Scholastic. And I'm, I can't say very much about them, but, I, but I'm having so much fun working on them. And it's like, it's this thing where it's like you wake up in the morning and it's like, oh no, I have to write a bunch of hilarious jokes about Star Wars characters today. What an awful life I have, you know what I mean? It is that sort of thing where I feel very lucky to be doing this and at the same time it's just a result of a lot of hard work and perseverance and but yeah to answer your other question it, it is the result of like a lot of things that happened to me when I was growing up a lot of formative events and just at a very young age just being very passionate about comic books and animation and television just thinking I want to work in these fields and just thinking that the people that inspired me growing up, both directly, people that I met, like cartoonists that, that I met personally at comic book conventions, and just people that I saw from afar, like, you know, comedy writing heroes of mine that I didn't meet when I was a kid, per se, but just that I was aware of, that I would often study their careers and think, well, what do they do? What do they, how do they turn this, how is this a career? How is this a job? You know what I mean? How do you actually, and again, this sounds crass, but it is, it's a question you ask yourself when you're, when you're going through adolescence, you're thinking, okay, I want to do this as an adult for a living. How do you make a living doing this? You know what I mean? And I found that like a lot of folks that work in comics, they do some comic book work, they do some work in television writing, you know, episodes of different TV shows. A lot of them write nonfiction books as well. You know, so you you have different sides to your career, you, you have different streams of income, you have different areas of interest. And that kind of, it keeps you creatively fulfilled, but also it kind of keeps you busy, it keeps you doing different things, and it keeps your brain active, you know what I mean? And, and it keeps you, it just keeps you on your toes. So one of the things that you mentioned there was uh, the conventions, um, and that was something you're saying that you went to before you really, you know, became, uh, uh, became a writer and 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 so forth. Um, uh, that that sort of dovetails with the question I had about for people growing up, like say in the Midwest, who um, are maybe reading your work or um, uh, have an interest in writing for comics and so forth. Is that some advice you would give them as a way to sort of try to figure out how people are um, uh, finding their their paths within these industries? 
I, I'd say it is, just because, first of all, I, if you want to get into comics, either as a writer or an artist or an editor, I mean, from my experience anyway, so many comics writers and artists, and, and this applies to editors as well, are so approachable and down to earth that you can go to a comic book convention, even if it's a big one like New York Comic Con or San Diego Comic Con, and, and oftentimes actually meet these folks face to face and get to talk to them, get a, you know, put a face to a name. As long as you don't come off like some kind of psychopath or something, as long as you, you know, you're polite and respectful, that, that's what I mean by that. You know, you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you keep that in check. And um, is that sort of an occupational hazard, the, the like psychopath uh, fan coming up to you at a convention? No, it isn't. And certainly for the most part, I mean, I'd say like 99% of the time, I, when, when I've been approached by, by people, they've been incredibly nice and they've been incredibly, you know, one time there was, there was a time when I did a signing early on of, from Crack Out of Krypton and there was this guy came up to me and I, let's say that his name was John Johnson. I don't remember his name. This was years ago. And he came up to me and he was like, uh, I have a novel. Uh, how can I get it published? Will you publish my novel? How do I, you know? And I was like, Well, I'm not a publisher. I'm, I'm, I'm an author, and you you send your manuscript to how you do it is you send you know you send your manuscript to different publishers. You ideally you, you get an agent first, and um, you know you, you send out queries and you send out manuscript or sample chapters or whatever. There, there's a couple different ways of doing it. And he's like he like shoves this giant handwritten, not typed, mind you. And I don't even think there were like page numbers on it, this giant like manifesto of a novel manuscript down on my table where I was signing copies of the book, by the way. And he's like, this is, my name is, is John Johnson. This book is called John Johnson and his travels through time. He's, time traveler, it's me if I was a time traveler. And I was like, first of all, you're going to want to type it up because not everyone can read your handwriting. So it's considered very professional to type these things up. And I said in a very calm way, because I don't know who I'm dealing with. And he's like, well, I want you to publish it. Will you publish it? And then my cousin Jeremy, who's a, hey, Jeremy, who's a, who's a police officer, was like starting to get very like, oh, maybe I should intervene here. And so was my wife, Nadine, who was like, what's going on? And, um, you know, he's like, this is about me. This is about, I want you to publish. And I was like, I'm not a publisher. I'm sorry, I can't. And that aside from that, the fans have been just incredible and incredibly nice and giving and so supportive. And uh, I mean, I wouldn't have a career without them, so I can't. That's a cliche, but it's really true. Well, so, yeah, it uh, tends to be really passionate in industry where you associate that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, real interest. I mean, these, these conventions wouldn't go on, obviously, if these fans weren't so into these characters and into these storylines. Yeah, and I'll say the other thing about, like, you know, just dealing with just meeting people at conventions that might be future colleagues, future co-workers, people you want to work with, you know, when you turn pro, is that they can give you honest critiques of your work. You know what I mean? You can, um, you can show them your portfolio. If it's a writing portfolio, you know, it's harder for them to, to judge it there, then and there. And say, can you send me something when I'm back in my office or something like that? Or if you have something to hand over to them that they, they probably won't be able to read it until they're back in their office. If it's an art portfolio, it's easier for them to just sort of look at it then and there. But even then, they might want to just take some time and, and more leisurely look through it. But I do know that certainly when I went to some of the smaller conventions as a, as a teenager, and I brought my art portfolio, because at the time, I was drawing a lot of cartoons, and that's... I did draw cartoons for some magazines, like magazine gag cartoons and stuff, when I was starting out as a writer, also doing cartooning. Um, when I was a teenager, that's more where I wanted my career to go, you know, in, in, as a comic book artist as opposed to a writer, or ideally both, you know, but I'd show my art portfolio to, to these, like, well-known cartoonists, and they'd give me really, really constructive feedback. And, you know, for the most part, they were very, very, they were very nice about it, they were very patient about it, you know, and it was just a really good formative experience where, excuse me, where it taught me that, you know, a lot of the folks in the comics industry want to sort of give back to the community and they're very, and, and again, that they're very grateful to, to the fans who are supporting their work. And so I, I feel like 
that's a good attitude to have, and I definitely feel the same way. One of the one of your works that I'm uh, specifically familiar with, in part because you have this great use of the page, and um, uh, is uh, from Crack Out of Krypton, Jews and Comic Books. Um, before we talk about the interior of the work, I have to ask about uh, the late Harvey Picar's introduction for the work. Is he someone that um, that you got to work with at all with that? Oh yeah, I, he he is. But it was it was a very interesting situation. Basically, what happened was that. God, I'll never forget this. this. is crazy. I was in L.A. I was crashing with a friend. I was... I had written this screenplay that had gotten on a lot of people's radar, and I was at different studios pitching it and talking about possibly selling it, possibly getting it made, you know. And I get this call on myself from Harvey Picar, and it was a, hey, this is Harvey Picar, uh... You know, so I understand you want me to do the the forward to your, and that's a, this is a terrible Harvey P. Carr impression, but it's you know he was so nice and he was so and he's again he was so I keep using that using this this phrase but he, he was so down to earth and he was so self deprecating and he was like well I've written something I'd like to read it to you over the phone he wasn't a big email person he wasn't a big computer you know he wasn't really didn't like to use technology very much in general. Um, and he reads it to me over the phone, and it sounds great. And it's like, and it's Harvey Picard, so honestly, I'll take anything he gives me because I'm so great. I'm so happy that he'll that he wants to do anything to do with my book. But he'd read the manuscript. You know, I had a, a short list of people that I wanted to do, to write the foreword, and he was at the top of the list. And I was so happy that that he was even considering doing it. But at that point, I think he had committed to doing it. And yeah, that's right, because he had committed. He had already written a draft, and he reads it to me over the phone. And he's like, what do you think? Do you want me to change anything? And I'm like, no, 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 just just keep it. And a friend of mine, J.T. Waldman, is a who's an illustrator and cartoonist, and he he illustrated it. And he'd, he'd worked with Harvey. I think this might have been the beginning of his relationship with Harvey, but he worked with Harvey a couple of times on a couple of different projects after that. And he was just so sweet and so cool and, and just really great. And it was so nice seeing that forward come together and JT would like, you know, send me different versions of it and like, here's the pencil art, here's the final inks, here it is in color, you know what I mean? And it was great. It was, it was really fun. So it was just, I, I think I met him at conventions like once or twice after that. He was great. He was very cool. Well, well tell me a little bit about the genesis of that book then. Okay. So I had written, and this goes back to 2002, 2003. Um, I've been writing a number of articles at that point for the, a magazine that's no longer around, unfortunately. It was a lot of fun writing for them. It was called Reform Judaism Magazine. And they gave me a lot of work. They were some, one of my first sort of steady clients uh, as a freelancer. And I had written a series of magazine articles for them prior to that about Jews and comedy. Just being a comedy writer myself and having written for Mad Magazine which was also one of my first steady clients, um, and having written for a couple of TV shows, and like this show on MTV called TRL, where I wrote jokes for Carson Daly, and that, that was my first screen credit. That was my first uh, credit writing credit on a TV show. And so basically, because of that, I wrote an, a series of articles for them on Jews in, the, in comedy, Jews, mostly comedy writers I was writing about, writers for The Daily Show, writers for Sid Caesar, writers for Saturday Night Live, like how comedy writing and, and TV comedy developed over from the end of World War II until today. Today being like 2001, 2002, when the articles came out. Um, after that, they wanted me to do something on Jews and comic books. At first, my first pitch to them was, we do one article on Jews and comic books, one article on Jews and magazine gag cartooning, because I also had a background in, in doing that, writing and drawing uh, magazine gag cartoons, like a little one panel gags, like, like sort of the cartoons you'd see in The New Yorker, but not specifically for The New Yorker, for like, you know, Nickelodeon magazine and things like that, which is some of the magazines I, I drew cartoons for. And then the third part of the series was going to be on, that's right, it was newspaper strips. It was Jews in, in uh, newspaper comic strips and the history of that. And then I realized early on that Jews in comic books, there was so much material there to talk about that that should be all three. It should be all three parts should be about Jews and comic books. The gold part one should be the golden age, part two should be the silver age, 
part three should be like, I guess, the Bronze Age and the present and whatever we're calling the present. And the present being, again, like 2002 or 2003. So I wrote this three-part series, and it immediately got on people's radar, and people started blogging about it and talking about it online. And I found out the comic book editors were sort of passing it around to one another. Um, at some pretty big comic book companies, folks, you know, like at DC. And it just became a big hit. And almost immediately, I started getting emails from book publishers saying, do you want to turn this into a book? And that led to my first two book deals, which were for a book called Masters of the Comic Book Universe Revealed, which was a book of jour journalistic profiles of cartoonists and comic book creators like um, Jerry Robinson and Kyle Baker, Marjan Satrapi, Will Eisner, Neil Gaiman, people like that, uh, Gilbert Hernandez, and Love and Rockets. And the second book was really a, an expansion of those three articles that I did on Jews and comic books, and that was from Krakow to Krypton. And, you know, I used the three magazine articles as kind of a template, but really the book is a, a completely all-new entity. It, it's not like it doesn't really use material from the the magazine articles very much. It's all completely reworked, and it's all, you know, it's a completely new thing, so to speak. A little bit more about the book. Um, there's so many fascinating facts about uh, uh, comics that you cover in there, but mm -hmm. since we're in Kansas, we're sure. close to, uh, uh, in Wichita here, the, the earth home of a certain son of Krypton. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, even, even Superman's Kryptonian name, Kal, is infused with uh, Hebrew, mm -hmm. all that God is. Um, are there other examples that come to mind of just how integral Jewish culture is to the, the comic book culture? Yeah, um, there's a few. Uh, a lot of people talk about the fact that Superman is sort of like this, like an alien as immigrant metaphor, you know. And I think there's something to be said for that. That's certainly used in a lot of recent Superman stories. Um, Superman as, as a metaphor for, for immigrants in general. I think that's something that science fiction does quite a bit, is that, you know, it's a way to, to introduce a powerful metaphor. A lot of science fiction is metaphor. You know, a lot of uh, the example that springs to mind most immediately is Twilight Zone, the TV show, from the, especially the original Twilight Zone from the late 50s and early 60s. You know, a lot of episodes were about racism or they're about, you know, gender issues or they're about war or, you know what I mean, um, or the evils of war. But, you know, so as not to hit you over the head with that, they cloak it in metaphor. That, well, it's about aliens. It's about cloning. It's about robots. It's about you know what I mean. But you know the audience knows what it's really about. What's really being said. I think that's sometimes the case with Superman stories. Whether Siegel and Schuster had that in mind when they created Superman, I don't think that's the case. You know, I do think. I do think that you could say that Superman is in a way a Moses figure, in the as. Moses gets put into the into the basket and shoved it down the Nile by his birth mother and then he is found by his Egyptian foster family and becomes part of the royal family of Egypt and you know and thinks that that's who he is and then realizes his true heritage um, when he comes of age as an adult and then becomes the leader of the the Jewish people it's a little similar to how Superman is born on Krypton, as a baby, he's put into the rocket, he's shoved away to, to planet Earth where he's, he's raised by the Kents, a kindly Midwest farming couple were specifically from Kansas. There's actually, you know, Man of Steel was on TV last night, and I noticed there's a line towards the end where the, the general, the Harry Lennox character, the general says to him, he's like, how can we trust you? And... You know, he's like, it's something like, how can we trust you? You're an alien. And Superman's like, I grew up in Kansas. I'm as American as you can get. And I thought, see that, Kansans? Is that a word? Is that what it is, Kansans? Okay. Um, but you know what I mean? It's like, yes, I'm pandering. But it's also in the movie. And it is kind of there to give us a sense that he's very grounded, you know, uh, that he's got these kind of, parents that are Midwest farmers that have a very quintessentially American sense of right and wrong that they've imparted to him. And I'm not saying, and that, and that, I don't want to say that like, I think you can get very 
kind of muddled there and say and make it sound like Americans have a monopoly on a sense of right and wrong. And I think that's wrong to say. I think that's ridiculous. You know, I think Superman's a citizen of the world. He's a citizen of the earth because it's his adoptive homeland. So he doesn't just consider America his homeland. He considers the entire earth and that's what he wants to help. But I do think that the, the idea of giving him these Midwest farming parents gives him kind of a groundedness. You know what I mean? Um, and it kind of gives him this work ethic and it kind of gives him this specifically the types of p people that his parents were not so much just that they were from the Midwest, but just that they were the people that they were, you know, gives him the sense of like ethical responsibility. And that's why he becomes a hero. I think that what it is, is that the people that his parents were, uh, that it's a question of like nature versus nurture. That's what it's at the heart of a lot of Superman stories. And I think the fact that he's a Moses figure isn't that, that Siegel and Schuster were trying to like promote him as a Moses figure. I think that they took a lot of aspects from a lot of different heroic characters from different cultures. You know, he's got aspects of King Arthur. You know, the King Arthur story is kind of like the Moses story. He was raised by a foster family, lifts the sword out of the stone and realizes what his true parentage is. And he's the son of Uther Pendragon and becomes a hero. You know, and so I think with Siegel and Schuster giving him the foster parents and the birth parents on another planet and everything. They were trying to sort of give him these, these story elements. They were trying to give Superman's origin story these, these elements that made it kind of seem ar archetypally heroic and kind of seem universal, universally heroic and, and kind of seemed like it recalled the Moses story and the King Arthur story and the Hercules story and things like that. You know what I mean? And also recalled things like, like Flash Gordon, like newspaper strips like that. And, uh, and so I think that that's kind of what they were trying to create with Superman. I don't think they were trying to kind of write code for their Jewish readers, though. Well, yeah, they, they drew on all these sort of foundational myths, mm -hmm. and then they yeah. end up creating their own. I mean, Superman has now become such an integral part of like the American consciousness. I often ask my students, who many of whom have never touched a comic in their mm -hmm. life, but they can tell me all these facts about characters like Superman or characters like Wonder Woman. They they are too young to know the old you know Linda Carter TV show or anything like that, but they can describe her, you know, perfectly and what her abilities are and what she represents. And it's it's clear that that's just such a part of their consciousness, even if they they don't engage in those characters in that way. But can they tell you who Sue Wonder Woman's nemesis was in issue 234 of the original, the original series, Darren? Not, not the relaunch. No, um, no, but you're right. I, I do think that there's that aspect of these characters where they're so ingrained in pop culture that people respond to them. And I think there's a reason that these characters have been around so long. I think they do resonate, you know what I mean? And I think that people, Wonder Woman, what's fascinating about Wonder Woman in specific is that she's, such a, she's become such a feminist icon. I think that was kind of the idea when William Mar Moulton Marston created her because I think he was a feminist and I think he was very progressive for his time. You know what I mean? And I think he did have a lot of progressive ideas and uh, I think Certainly he did some want some unusual ideas in there. Yes, <laughs> yes, that, that's a whole other conversation. But I do think he wanted to create this character that was a strong female hero, you know, and I think that a lot of women respond to her on that level. Even women that don't read comic books very often or, you know, or don't read them at all, know who Wonder Woman is and respond to her as a strong female character. And I think that's great. Well, so tell me a little bit about um, your new book, uh, Swashbuckling Scoundrels, Pirates in Fact and Fiction. I certainly understand the, uh, the combination of Johnny Depp sashaying his way through uh, Pirates 11 or wherever we're at with that. I think series. five. I think five is the one in production right now, yeah. isn't it? I think. But um, also, we've got this growing problem with piracy around the world, which has been in the yeah, news yeah. a lot. Um, tell me a little bit about what uh, drew you to that, because uh, uh, there's a ton of research in that book. Yeah, thank you. I, I had a lot of fun writing Swashbuckling Scoundrels. It was certainly a very research-intensive book. It's the sort of book that, like, you know, you start out writing it and you think, well, it's juvenile nonfiction. How deep can you go with it? And the answer is very. Because there's a lot of juvenile nonfiction books that are just incredibly well researched and incredibly well written. I wanted this to be one of them. I wanted I wanted to talk about the fact that the scourge of piracy in the golden the so called golden age of piracy, what we now think of as the golden age, which is, you know, the area in the early the the period in the early seventeen hundreds when there was so much piracy 
all over the world, but specifically a lot of them, a lot of the pirates were from the UK. And so basically what happened, this ties into the, the recent spate of Somali pirate hijackings as well. But basically what happened in the early 1700s is that the War of Spanish Succession was over and there were a lot of legitimate sailors and privateers that were now out of business, that they're out of a job rather. Um, and they didn't know what to do to make a living. And a lot of captains were paying them like a third of what they, they or a half of what they had been making before. And, you know, they had to feed themselves. They had to feed their families. And I'm not excusing the fact that they became pirates. I'm not saying like, well, of course, it's great that they became, that they did this horrible thing and became violent criminals. You know what I mean? But I'm explaining it. And there's a, so I'm not excusing it, but I'm explaining it. And there's a difference. And the same is true with the Somali pirates because what's happened here is that they, a lot of them were legitimate fishermen and other countries came in and stole the fish from their waters and now they don't have a job and so they're trying to figure out a way to make a living and it's very much like what happened with organized crime in the early 20th century in America where a lot of folks came from these ethnic ghettos and they did not, you know, a lot of these people who became gangsters and, um, you know, a lot of them came from like they were Italian Americans or Jewish Americans. Um, and they became gangsters because they felt like they weren't getting a, a fair shake. The, the system was rigged against them. They needed to make a living. You know, it's, it's always, it seems like it's the same story a lot of the time. And again, I'm not excusing their behavior or their actions. But I think it's important to explain why they, they felt they, did, they needed to do what they did. Well, what, um, uh, what's next? For uh, Ari Kaplan, what, what do you have in the pipeline here? I know you have the new Avengers book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a couple different different projects. Well, I, I wrote the cover story for The Simpsons Trials of Horror 21, which um, came out last month from Bongo Comics, which is Matt Groening's comic book company, Simpsons creator Matt Groening. And the story is called Graveyard Shift, and it's uh, penciled by Ryan Rivette, inked by Patrick Owsley. And it's really good. It's a really fun story. It's a parody of the 1984 movie Gremlins with Apu, as you can see on the cover, um, who's being beset by these gremlins that look like Bart. The actual Bart Simpson is often terrorizing Apu. And now in this story, we've got, you know, the Bart gremlins attacking him. And um, it's a parody of gremlins, but I also drew on my uh, love and affection for TV shows like Twilight Zone and Thriller, the early 60s TV show with, with uh, Boris Karloff, and other horror and sci-fi anthology shows like that. And so I wanted it to kind of feel like an episode of one of those shows too. Um, and I had, a lot, had so much fun working on it, and, and I'm very proud of that story. And then I wrote three stories in this five-minute Avengers stories collection. There's 12 in total, and I wrote three of them. And there's, they're prose fiction short stories for kids. Each one... Uh, when we write them, we time them with the stopwatch uh, to be under five minutes, to be just uh, ab about five minutes. You know, you can be, they can be read to children in about five minutes and um, each. And uh, so one of them involves Iron Man and one of them is about the Falcon, although Captain America and Black Widow are in that story as well. And one of them is a story about uh, Hawkeye, although again, Iron Man and Modoc, the villain Modoc, are in that story uh, also. And that the the Hawkeye story, Robin Hawk, is where because he's an archer and because he's he's dressed in in very colorful clothing, that he's actually the legendary outlaw Robin Hood. And he can't tell them otherwise. He tries to tell them he's not Robin Hood, and they're like, No, no, you're Robin Hood. And it's a lot of fun. They think Modoc is an ogre, and they they think that Iron Man is an, that Tony Stark is a knight because he's dressed in a suit of armor. Because what else would they think? So I try to think what are the reference points for for these different characters. So this, the Five Minute Avengers Stories collection is coming out from um, Disney Book Group's Marvel Press imprint at the end of the year, and I'm very happy with the way the stories came out. I, I think they're great. They're really well illustrated. A lot of fun. I had, I had a great time working with the editors on this, and. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a great book. I'm really proud to be a part of it. Well, your work is so far ranging. I wish we could take uh, more time here today, but I, I want to uh, thank you for the interview and I uh, look forward to reading your work. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. Thanks. As Jay mentioned, my name is Ari Kaplan, as Wikipedia has also said. Um, and I'm a comic book writer and I also am a screenwriter for television and video games and transmedia. And I'm going to talk a lot about that. But, you know, I have a select number of images that I'm going to also show today. 
and uh, we're going to talk about each of those images and sort of how the projects that they represent came to be and kind of behind the scenes stories about them. And afterwards, I'll be hap happy to, uh, to, to take any questions that you have. We can have like a Q&A session too as part of this. And um, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly happy and delighted to be here. I have lectured all over the world. Somehow, I have not lectured uh, in Wichita until this, this moment, which I kind of can't believe hasn't happened yet. But I'm so glad to be here. That, yes, yes, ap applaud the location on which we are standing. Let's hear it for locations and pieces of ground that are demarcated as different from other pieces of ground and pieces of land that are arbitrarily named with city names and such. Yes, go, go geography. Um, there's a story about that I can tell. On the way over here, this is true story. Um, a, the TSA agent, like, you know, t at La LaGuardia Airport is like, excuse me, sir, can you tell me what the five oceans, can you name the five oceans? And I'm like, excuse me? And he's like, can you name the five? And so I start naming, I'm like, the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific. And I'm like, why did you want to know that? And he's like, just, just wondering. And then I, I go on to like put my, my, you know, my, my wallet and everything into the little bins that they have, you know, and I hear him ask the woman behind me, like, excuse me, ma'am, can you tell me what the seven continents are? And I'm like, what is going on? So then I get to the gate, and I'm like, excuse me, the TSA guy um, asked me what the five oceans are. Is this some weird vetting process I don't know about? Is this some security thing? And he's like, I think that guy was having fun with you. So just be aware, this is what the TSA is doing right now. And if I end up on some no-fly list for exposing their horrible criminal mastermind schemes, so be it. You've all, I've, I've saved your lives. I've helped you all not be played with by the TSA. That sounded really dirty. Anyway, um, but, uh, you know, I started out writing for a variety of different TV shows. My first writing credit on a TV show was on MTV's TRL, otherwise known as Total Request Live, where I wrote for jokes for Carson Daly. Did someone clap? Clap, by all means. Yes. I thank you for that smattering of pity applause. Now, um, no, that was a lot of fun, and it, was, and it is really a rush even today after having written for several different shows. Uh, it's a big rush. It's a lot of fun seeing your name in the writing credits on, on a show and knowing that, that so many other people are watching. It's really good, and it's very gratifying. Um, after writing for various TV shows and also developing different TV projects, some of which made it to the screen, some did not, I decided to, to try giving comic book writing uh, a shot. It was really weird. I, uh, I wrote this miniseries called Speed Racer Chronicles of the Racer, and the project had a really interesting genesis. Basically what happened was that I was at the San Diego Comic Con in 2007, and I had written, let's see, the week before, a wonderful comic book editor named Joan Hilty had bought two Ben 10 comic book scripts that I, that I pitched DC Comics. Because at the time they had, a, they had a series called Cartoon Network Action Pack, which had like comics based on different licensed properties for Cartoon Network, different Cartoon Network shows. So they did the like the Codename Kids Next Door comics and the uh, Samurai Jack comics and things like that. And they did the Ben 10 comics, and so I pitched them uh, a few Ben 10 stories, and, and I think three of them made the cut. And that was a lot of fun. That was that was great. It was really fun writing them. And as I was in the middle of writing them, I thought I could use that as a bargaining chip to like get other comic book work maybe, go to, go to San Diego Comic-Con, see what other business I can drum up for myself in comics. And I went to the IDW publishing booth and who was it? I guess it was Scott and David Tipton who were brothers who were writing at the time the Star Trek comics for IDW. And I gave them my card and I was like, are any of the editors around? They're like, well, Chris Ryle is the editor in chief. And um, I think that was his position at the time. And they're like, we can give him your card if you give it to us. And I was like, sure. So I gave him my card and I stopped by later when they told me to and I saw he was talking to some movie producer and he stops talking to the guy, the, the meeting ends, and he turns to me and he's like, oh yeah, the, the Tiptons gave me your, cover, your card. Um, what, what kind of work do you do? And I said, well, you know, I've been writing some screenplays and working as a script doctor on other scripts and you know, writing for a couple TV shows. I write for a lot of magazines. And uh, Mad Magazine was, I think, the credit that impressed him the most because I had been writing for them for a number of years. 
And it's weird because Mad, some people consider it to be a comic book, some people consider it to be a magazine. It's kind of both. Uh, but, you know, until I was writing other comics, it's weird because they've like, now all these comics database websites have like grandfathered in all my mad work, you know, ever since I've started writing for other comics. So that, that's strange. But um, I asked him if he needed writers for anything. He said, well, you know, you said you just written some Ben 10 comics for DC. Those are all ages comics, meaning that they're children's comics. We do have, we're looking for someone to write a Speed Racer miniseries. Would you be interested in pitching for that? And I was like, sure. So I sent him, we, we set up a time to talk when we were back both in our respective offices and our respective cities. And I had, in the, in the interval, I had come up with a list of like 10 different ideas for Speed Racer stories, for, for what the miniseries would be about. 10 different plot ideas, you know. So, so they, they could fill up like 10 different miniseries, uh, possibly. And the last one, was I thought the silliest and goofiest one, but it was the one that excited me the most. And I thought, this one, they're never going to say yes to it. They're just not in a million bazillion years because it's so, it's so bizarre. But I, it's so much fun and it lights such a fire in my belly. And I was like, I'm gonna, that's the first one I'm going to pitch them because that's my gut instinct. And the idea was, it's called Speed Racer Chronicles of the Racer. As you can see, nothing happened with it. Um, that's, that's the one that got made. Uh, and the premise was, for those of you who, ha who haven't read it, the premise was that Speed, Speed Racer, discovers that he's the latest in a long line of racers, which are these champions uh, that have existed since the dawn of hum human civilization. And where I came up with the idea was that I thought, you know, the weird thing about Speed Racer is his first name is actually Speed, not a nickname. It's his given birth name, and his surname is actually Racer. And I thought, you know, for a lot of people, and this is true, I, just knowing, knowing this, having studied history and, and, and everything. For a lot of folks, what the family name is, what the surname is, is what your family used to do for a living. You know, uh, Cooper is, uh, is, used to be a barrel maker, someone who made barrels in medieval times, so, that, that's what, so if your name is Cooper, maybe someone in your family at some point made barrel. You know, if your name is Silver or Silverstein, maybe you're, you're, someone in your family was a silversmith or something of that nature, you know and on and on. Glover, like Danny Glover, you know, is someone who literally made gloves. Now, I thought with Racer, maybe the family name is Racer because they used to actually literally be Racers. So I came up with this pitch where that was the case. And I came up with this all new family backstory for Speed Racer. And so we would alternate between the present day story of Speed, who's trying to uncover this mystery where someone knows a lot about his family, more about his family than he knows. Um, we'd alternate between that and these stories of these past racers. And so part one, would, it, would be, um, it would be a Roman charioteer called Swiftus Romulus, and he drives a uh, chariot called the Marcus V, which is instead of the Mach 5. And it's this pimped out chariot that has all these cool special features in it that can do, it's like if James Bond had a chariot, or if Speed Racer had, it, had a chariot, more, more accurately. I should really frame it that way, shouldn't I? And, um, and I have like this MacGuffin that, that runs through all the story and, and in, in the idea is that in every one of these time periods where you see all these, these other racers from the past, there's always a speed racer character, uh, you know, which is one of his ancestors. And there's also a character who's sort of uh, analogous to, to Racer X. There's a Racer X analog and there's always a Trixie character in every one of these past racer stories. And there's always a Spritel character and a Chim Chim character, but the Chim Chim character is a different animal each time. Um, and so in the, in, the, in the Old West story in part four, uh, where he's a Navajo, uh, he's a Native American, and um, the Chim Chim is Howl Howl, who's a coyote. And um, because it's a, to, coyotes are big in Navajo folklore. So, uh, you know, I actually did, did do a lot of, of historical research for the series, even though it could be written off as like this, you know, silly, uh, all ages kids comic, which which it was on some level, but I tried to give it, I tried to do my research and do my due diligence and work a lot of historical references into the stories and, and just have as much fun as possible. And I had a great time writing this series. It was, it was really a lot of fun. Um, really got to like, you know, as Orson Welles says, says about film, it's like the greatest electric train set a boy could have, because back then, kids, people played with electric trains, apparently. I don't know. It was a thing. 
Look it up. Ask your grandparents. Anyway, but um, I kind of felt the same way about this. I kind of felt the same way about this. I, I kind of felt one of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer writers, uh, I can't remember exactly which one, said that, um, that writing for Buffy and writing for a lot of TV shows is, it has this sort of Harold and the Purple Crayon effect where you write something in a script, you're like exterior submarine day, and then the next day they're building a submarine on the set because of what you wrote. You know what I mean? And it's this bizarre thing where I've certainly experienced that quite a bit. I was a staff writer on a show called True TV Presents World's Dumbest, where I wrote a lot of comedy sketches and jokes for people like Gilbert Gottfried and Chuck Nice and Mike Britt and uh, Judy Gold and, and people like that. And it was, does anyone know the show? Any uh, show of hands of anyone who's ever seen it? I was just, okay, some of you. Um, and I certainly had that, that feeling when I was working on that show where I wrote a sketch about Gollum, the Lord of the Rings character. Gollum, we, basically, we made, we would make fun of all these videos that people would send us from all over the world. That's what the show was. It was no, what's known as a clips show. People would know, people would send us, Video, uh, videos from all over the world. A lot of them were these viral videos that have been really popular on YouTube and World Star Hip Hop and things like that. And um, you'd see them on, you know, on Vimeo or you'd see them on Gawker in the morning or whatever. And we would make fun of them. We would write sketches and jokes for the various cast members to, to, to perform and to make fun of the, the clips. And one time, you know, there's this clip of this guy uh, who was officiating at his buddy's wedding. He'd become ordained as a minister, I think, online. And he's, he's officiating the wedding, and he drops the wedding ring into a nearby pond. And so I wrote a sketch where Gollum from Lord of the Rings picks up the, the ring, and he's like, you know, oh, the ring is tricks, you know, and he's like, stupid humans is have wedding near lake. And he, he runs away with the wedding ring. And, and so first they were like, well, it's a funny sketch, Ari, but how the hell, how are we going to... We don't have any CGI budget for to create Gollum. And I said, no, no, we do it like they do it on Saturday Night Live. We get a cast member. We get Chris Fairbanks, who is very skinny, and so he could play Gollum. We ask him very nicely if he'll do it dressed in nothing but a loincloth, which we did. And um, we have him, you know, we put a bald cap on him, a bald, you know, a bald head and hair wig, and put giant prosthetic ears on him and some, a couple strands of fake hair and make him look like he's very bruised, like Gollum with makeup and a loincloth, and have him do a Gollum impression, see if he can do like Andy Serkis in, as, as Gollum in the Lord of the Rings movies. And that's exactly what we shot. But it's weird because the next day after you have the story meeting where you decide that's what we're going to do, you see, you know, PA is like touching up the bald head wig with, with makeup and everything. And they're about to send it to the studio in, in L.A. where they, they shoot, where Chris Fairbanks lives because like some cast members shot in L.A. and some shot in the studio in New York where, where we were, where the writer's room was and where, where, where uh, we were located. Um, and it, it definitely has that Harold and Purple Crayon effect, and that's certainly an effect that I get from writing a lot of comics like this one, like Speed Racer. And it was just a lot of fun. I really got to do kind of whatever I wanted, like whatever my imagination could allow. You know, within, within limits, within reason. Um, and really tried to update the Speed Racer characters for the 21st century. This was the first Speed Racer comic in, I think, 10 years. There was one that Wildstorm had put out that I think Tommy Yoon had written and directed, uh, written and directed, written and illustrated um, about ten, 10 years prior. But this was the first one in a while. And I really felt it's a good idea to kind of write Speed Racer as a modern teenager, have his and Trixie's relationship be like a real boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, which I didn't feel like it had been in the past, and really kind of have Speed and his father have like a real father-son relationship, give Mom Racer, and that is her name, she does not have a first name, um, give Mom Racer more to do, have her be actually part of the racing team where she's fixing cars and she's repairing cars and stuff, because come on, it's ridiculous just to have her be, there's no, no disrespect to Housewives, but I mean, honestly, I wanted to have her be a more active female character in the series. Um, and just, just wanted to give everyone kind of new life, all the characters. And I ran everything by the editor and by the folks at Speed Racer Enterprises who held the rights to Speed Racer at the time. And everyone was really on board with what I was doing. I had a lot of fun. This kind of jump-started my comics career, this and those, those Ben 10 comics. And, and as a result, I was soon writing, you know, Tales from the Crypt comics and a Superman story for DC and all, the, all these other things. In fact, speaking of Superman story, do I just press the arrow? Is it just... Yeah, okay. Ah, there is, and like magic. 
like magic it appears. Um, this was a lot of fun. This was uh, the DC Universe Holiday Special from 2009, and I wrote a Superman story for this called Man of Snow. Um, it's where Superman is attacked by a snow golem, or a snow -lum, as you might call it, and uh, it, was, it was really interesting because basically Eddie Braganza, who was editing the holiday specials at the time, they would do, DC would put out a holiday special each year, and they would have these holiday-themed stories featuring all the superhero characters. And it was so much fun writing this. It was even fun pitching for it. And basically, when they asked me to pitch ideas for this, Eddie was like, took me aside near Comic-Con one year, and he was like, okay, we'd like you to start pitching ideas for the holiday special for, for 09. And um, all we need is like three or four pitches. And knowing you, you'll probably give us like a dozen. So I sent him 13 to prove him wrong, because that's not a dozen. And I'm like, well, what are you talking? I wouldn't send you a dozen. I'd send you 13. And um, so there, there were a lot of interesting ideas in that batch. One of them was a, a Christmas Carol, Dickens, a Christmas Carol with Two-Face, the Batman villain, Two-Face, like doing a Christmas Carol. You know what I mean? So you'd look upon his past and his present and his f possible future. That was one of the ones I liked the most that, that they didn't choose. And obviously, the one that they did choose was the Superman one, which I was very happy with because that was one of my favorite ones. I put that way at the top. Um, another one that they were that that I was that I sent them that I obviously they didn't have me pursue was where um, the Green Lantern ring falls on uh, is is given by a dying alien not to test pilot Hal Jordan not to Kyle Rayner not to to John Stewart uh, the, not to Guy Gardner these are these are all the the modern day late twentieth century early twenty first century. Um, uh, pe Earth people that, that, have, that have inherited the ring from the dying alien Abin Sur, but in, in this story, which was going to be called the Green Hammer Corps, it was going to be that um, that the, the Green Lantern ring is, is actually bequeathed to uh, the Maccabees, the fabled uh, Jewish warriors of, of ancient times, um, and they would use the ring to become the Green Hammer Corps because the word Maccabee means, he, means uh, hammer, and they would use it to manifest all these, um, all these various things with their willpower and, and defeat, defeat their oppressors. This one, the one that they did choose, was called Man of Snow. It was, as I say, Superman fights a snow golem. Um, it's kind of a fun, it's a general holiday story. It's specifically, it's a Hanukkah story, but I think it could work for any winter holiday, honestly. And um, I kind of decided to tap into Superman's feelings of like loneliness and isolation in this story a little bit because I, I just kind of figured that's, that's something that some other comics writers have, have dealt with when writing Superman stories. It's certainly something Alan Moore has dealt with when writing a couple of his Superman stories. And I felt that's something that doesn't get explored a lot. And I only kind of tap into it a little bit. Because basically what, what ends up happening in the story, for those who haven't read it, is that Superman just finds himself being attacked by this snow golem. He keeps saying, get Superman, get Superman, in a very robotic uh, way. As though he's, he's being controlled by someone. He's, you know, because the, the golem... For those of you who don't know the legend of the golem, it's this monster. It's traditionally made out of clay, but in some versions of the story, it could be made out of other things. And it was created by a rabbi in the, in the Jewish ghetto of Prague hundreds of years ago to defeat uh, people persecuting the Jews. Now, you, you create a golem by writing the word uh, emet, which is Hebrew for truth, on the golem's forehead. Uh, you, that's how you activate it. You deactivate it by crossing out one of the letters, and it leaves the Jewish word for uh, for death, met, and then the, the golem goes goes blank, goes deactivated, and uh, is inert. Um, so my story, this kid uh, named Yosef, which is my middle name, um, Google it, I, it's true, um, is, he has the superpower to turn inanimate objects, uh, to bring inanimate objects to life, and he creates a snow golem and kind of just to have fun with him because he's home, he's a sickly kid who's home alone a lot and he feels lonely and so he creates these kind of monsters and creatures using his superpower to 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 have friends to play with essentially and i really found while i was writing the story that i really identified with this kid definitely i mean he's basically based on me at around 12 or 13 years years of age which is how old yosef is in the story but you know i found that i really identified with the kid i really felt for him quite a bit and Superman learns to feel for him too because he, he doesn't mean to have the golem attack Superman. That kind of happens by accident with the golem misinterpreting something that, that Yosef says. Um, 
and then Superman obviously finds his way back to, to Yosef in, in defeating the golem. Then we find out Yosef's story, and he lives, he lives with, with his grandfather, and he's very sick. And I found it was a really kind of fun story about being an outsider and being an outcast and being, feeling kind of isolated. And, you know, it's kind of a story that, like, holiday story that tugs at your heartstrings. I think it's fun. We're about to go into the winter holidays uh, in a few weeks anyway, so I think it's, it's kind of a timely uh, story. And I had great fun writing it. It's certainly one of my favorite uh, comic book stories that I've written. I've written several dozen at this point, and uh, this, this is definitely one of the ones that stands out the most. Uh, I love writing holiday-themed stories. I'll get to a Halloween story that I wrote in a little while. Um, I like writing holiday ones because, first of all, like it, part of it, I'll, I'll admit, is like my own narcissism and egomania because the thing about holiday stories is like everyone in the industry reads them. Everyone sees them. It's all plastered everywhere. They get a lot of, you know, they get a lot of play. Um, but also just it's great fun. They can be really whimsical. You can have a lot of fun with the characters. Um, you know, the, the, they're, always, they're always great to do. I like trying to do holiday-themed stories whenever I can, whether it's Hanukkah or Christmas or New Year's or Halloween or whatever. Um, so that's, that's kind of the behind-the-scenes story about that. It's also another I interesting um, side effect of writing Man of Snow is that the penciler, Nick Rungi, and the inker, Gabe El Taib, he, uh, those, those two folks, the three of us have become friends ever since. And we kind of hang out at conventions a lot, and we're always like looking for other projects to do, to do together. We're always talking about that. And Nick does a lot of covers for Dark Horse. He does a lot of the covers for the Ghostbusters comics and things like that. And I think he's done some, some covers for like G.I. Joe and certain other comic book series. I think, like, I think possibly Terminator for Dark Horse. Um, and he's, he's just incredibly talented. He's really good, and so is Gabe. And Gabe's a great colorist for DC. He works on he worked on Green Lantern for a while. Now he's a colorist on Martian Manhunter and a number of other series. And he's just tremendously talented um, as an artist and a colorist. Anyway, um, so moving on. This is something I did for very very young kids, and I still get um, fan mail about it from time to time from kids uh, all over the world. It's great. Uh, not saying like this is such a great co aren't I great didn't I do a great job what I am saying is it's great to get feedback like that from kids uh, it's called uh, it's Shadow Guy and Gamma Gal Heroes Unite it's the to date the only I believe the only uh, Club Penguin graphic novel Disney's Club Penguin uh, online game is very popular all over the world uh, does show of hands who knows Club Penguin anybody okay a lot of you yeah and so if any of you have played it yourselves when you were younger because uh, it's been around for almost 10 years, I believe. I think it's been a Disney license since like 07. Um, and uh, some of you might have younger siblings or nieces or nephews or whatever that, that play it. Um, it's a lot of fun writing something like this because it has such a built-in fan base. It's kind of pre-sold. But obviously the kids are either going to respond to it or not. And in this case, they responded to it a lot. In fact, if you go on YouTube, there's like this adorable video, this three-part video that this little girl in England made uh, where she acts out the entire graphic novel with puppets and toys. It's so cool. I love stuff like that. It's adorable. And the cool thing is that like when you write a comic of any kind, you're used to the fact that like critics are gonna are gonna review it and some of them are gonna like it and some of them don't. Um, and you know you accept that in the in the volatile ecosystem that is uh, the comics industry. Uh, you know you're gonna get some good reviews and some bad reviews. Um, but the cool thing about Shadow Guy and Gamma Gal Heroes Unite is like, you know, they're kids, so if they like it, they're just gonna, it's just gonna come out, it's not gonna come out of any kind of agenda or anything. It's just gonna come out of just either they respond to it or they didn't. And in this case, they really didn't. It was a lot of fun. I really tried to, tried to come up with a story that kind of recalled like the old Superboy and Supergirl comics that DC put out in the 50s and 60s. Had that kind of fun sense of wonder and sense of whimsy to it. And, um, I tried to come up with uh, a backstory for Shadow Guy and Gamma Gal. It's non-canon. It doesn't. It's not officially part of the Club Penguin canon on the online game. I have to have to make that clear because uh, some of you might know the kids who play Club Penguin uh, on online are very very serious about the the mythology and the backstory and the canon and everything. So I had to make clear within this comic that it's actually that the story is actually being told by a Penguin cartoonist. Um, 
like his name is Joe, I believe. Um, and that he's telling so like, uh, like a frame story that bookends it where you see Joe at his drawing board. I think his name is Joe. Um, it's been a while. And um, you see that he's drawing and writing the story and he's coming up with it. That, that was kind of our way, myself and, um, and my editor and, and the folks at Club Penguin, because we would have conference calls about this kind of stuff. And um, talk about, you know, we don't want to upset the fans who take the, the, who take the expanded universe of Club Penguin really seriously. So if we come up with a backstory for these characters, it has to be technically outside of the canon. Um, but, you know, I had a lot of fun figuring out who these characters really were, what their personalities are, what their backstory is, how they fit in with the other characters in the Club Penguin universe, like Gary the Gadget Guy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think I did a good job. It's, it, I had a lot of fun with it. Richard Carbajal, who's an extremely nice and extremely talented uh, and generous uh, illustrator. He did, he did a great job, just knocked it out of the park. Um, and, you know, it was a lot of fun working on this. And I still get letters, like Penguin Young Readers Group occasionally forwards me snail mail. I just, kids still write snail mail, who knew? And um, that, that's always great. This is a story, whoa, this is another uh, story I'm very proud of. Excuse me, Robert E. Howard's Savage Sword, which um, I believe it got canceled recently, but it was, this was the second to last issue, I think, issue nine. Uh, Dark Horse put it out. I don't know who, I, Interesting. To, I'm interested to know who among you are uh, fans of Robert E. Howard's work, and who knows the name, or at least has read uh, some of his stories. Of, okay, some of you. Robert E. Howard is the creator of Conan, Conan the Barbarian, Conan the Sumerian. He's known by different, different, uh, different names. Robert E. Howard not only created Conan, he also created a number of other characters. Um, you'll see some of them uh, down in, in, on the bottom of the screen. Conan, Sailor Steve Costigan, Conrad and Kirwin, Breckenridge Elkins, a really funny character, and more. Um, so Robert E. Howard Savage Sword was this really fun comics anthology um, where different writers and different artists would tell stories featuring various Robert E. Howard characters. Some of them were adaptations of his prose stories, and some of them were all new stories. This one was an all new one. It was the second Sailor Steve Costigan one, the one that I wrote. The first one was written by Joe Casey, and um, he's a really wonderful comics writer. And this one, and, and the Joe Casey one, I, I believe, was an adaptation of one of the prose stories, I think. This one was all new. It was called Paper Tiger. And um, Sailor Steve Costigan is kind of this hard, fi hard fighting, hard drinking, um, really tough uh, merchant sailor slash boxer, and he was a pro, you know he was a prize fighter occasionally. He would when whenever his ship would uh, would dock in a different city, he would get he would earn some extra spending money by getting himself set up at a different uh, like a fight club or some sleazy underground uh, boxing tournament, and uh, he would you know fight fight a couple guys and make some money. And so the stories are kind of like this twist on like the traditional Texas tall tale. Um, Robert E. Howard was from Texas. I lived in Houston, Texas for a few years. And um, I'm certainly very aware of that tradition. And for those who, who are f unfamiliar with the Sailor Steve Costigan character, he's kind of like Popeye for adults, you know? And he's this really fun, funny character. And it was just impossible not to have a lot of fun writing the story. But I did have to kind of like rewire my brain while writing it, because it was definitely like, Sailor Steve Costigan does not talk like me at all. First of all, he talks in this very specific, very distinct Texas twang. And it's also kind of like a parody of a Texas twang. And every word choice is completely different. First of all, he's a merchant sailor, which I'm not. Secondly, he's a prize fighter, which I'm not. He uh, grew up in Texas, so he has that accent. I don't, um, obviously. He's, uh, he lived in the 1930s. I, I don't. Uh, and so, you know, I really had to kind of think, how would he say different things? I got, got into character, so to speak, to write the story by reading a lot of Robert E. Howard's actual Sailor Steve Costigan prose stories, and also by writing a couple of monologues in the character of Sailor Steve Costigan, sort of figure out how he'd say certain things. And then I would started on the narrative, because uh, basically I pitched the Dark Horse editors um, an outline, like a, you know, a, like a pitch, so like one paragraph, one or two paragraphs. Just basically laying out, this happens, and then this happens, and Sailor Steve does this, and then this happens. 
um, and then you know laying out the beginning, the middle, and, and the end of the story. And they just had me go right to the script without even an outline, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, about half of the story is fighting. So I'll talk a little bit about what it's about, and then I'll tell you how I, how I put it together. It's not how I put every story together. Um, and what, it, what Paper Tiger is about is that Sailor Steve realizes that he's being, cha he's being tailed, he's being followed throughout his daily routine by someone. He doesn't know who it is. He can't recognize the guy, he sees the guy at, um, at one of his boxing matches, but the guy's obviously not a sports writer. Um, He's obviously not one of the plants that the uh, that the fight promoters have put in in the, the the audience to like talk it up and to you know cheer on the players and and cheer on the the boxers. So who is he? And so he confronts the guy, um, and the guy turns out to be Irving Patrick, who is a uh, pulp magazine writer. Um, who's doing a case creating a boxing character based on Sailor Steve Costigan and Irving wants to study Sailor Steve he wants to he wants his permission to, to create a character based on him and Sailor Steve wants wants nothing to do with it and then um, Sailor Steve is is confronted by a bunch of uh, these, these tough guys the McClendon brothers who characters I created for the for the uh, for the story um, who bet against him on the boxing match, and now they want the money that they lost. So they, they want to beat him up. And Irving is, is going to help Taylor Steve. And Taylor Steve does not want her, this is not Irving's fight. So he doesn't want Irving to help him. But Irving does anyway. Uh, and then at the end, Irving proves himself more than up to the task and actually helps defeat the McClendon brothers. And, and uh, Taylor Steve would have probably gotten his butt kicked without Irving's help. And so that gives Taylor Steve. That is, so Irving has earned Sailor Steve's respect, and now he, can, he has permission to write the story, and that's how it ends. And it was a lot of fun. And uh, the story is about half, half of it, at least half of it is fight scenes. So to do that, when you're writing a fight sequence, a lot of the time, I found, this works for fight sequences, and this works for a story that's very heavy on slapstick, on physical comedy. I, I storyboard it out. I draw thumbnail sketches as I'm scripting it. Um, that way, you don't have any, you don't have the comics equivalent of dead air, which is dead air is when on a TV term of when there's like silence, nothing's happening. You don't want it to happen. It's on like a live TV show like Saturday Night Live. Someone like forgets their lines and there's like, you know, silence for like a beat. No one wants that. It's just it's the kiss of death, and so you don't want the equivalent of that to happen in comics, especially not in a fight sequence. So I found that like, sort of laying everything out in thumbnails shows me how the scenes should flow in a narrative sense, and it shows how everything should work, and it cuts down on any possibility of there being any kind of dead air, and it also shows what I can cut to make the story shorter and more concise, which is always, is always a possibility. There's always something you can cut. That's, that's, I don't, I've never found that not to be the case. Um, and that was a really fun story, and I got a lot of really good feedback on it, and I know the Robert E. Howard Whatever it's called, the Robert E. Howard Estate? Might be the estate, I don't remember. But whoever licenses this stuff for on behalf of Robert E. Howard's family, um, they really liked the story, and uh, I, had a, I had a great time writing it. It was really cool. Uh, kind of postmodern story because Irving himself, uh, Irving Patrick, is a play on Patrick Irvin, which is one of Robert E. Howard's pseudonyms that he used to write under occasionally. So it's got a little bit of a meta aspect to it, too. It's also a meta story in that it's about a pulp writer. Robert E. Howard, the creator of Sailor Steve, was himself a pulp writer. This is one of the most recent stories I've written in comics, Simpsons Treehouse of Horror number 21. It came out in mid-September. It's still on some newsstands and comics, and still in some comic book stores, probably until, um, until Halloween evening, I'd say, probably. Um, it is, as you can probably tell from the cover art, a parody of the 1984 movie Gremlins, which is about, wait for it, Gremlins. And, um, and, and you know, this, this, this was just a blast. This was, uh, I was asked to pitch for Treehouse of Horror. I sent a ton of ideas uh, to the editors of Bongo Comics, including one that was a parody of the CW series Supernatural, which is called Stupid Natural, which was um, with Bart and Lisa as Sam and Dean from Supernatural, which I actually think that's an awesome idea, too, because I'm a big fan of that TV show. 
but um, but they decided to go with this one, which you know what? In the end, I think this one worked worked out better than Stupid Natural would have. Um, and this was a lot of. F I keep saying that about like I should should should. Uh, I'm letting you behind the curtain and everything. I should do like this was a this was a pain in the ass to write. No, no, they they, they are all of them a lot of fun. I uh, ha had a great time with it. Um, again, did a ton of storyboarding of, of thumbnail sketches while I was writing this. Um, and when you're writing something that's very heavy and slapstick and in verbal comedy, one of the reasons that you draw out thumbnail sketches while you're writing it is also to like brainstorm additional ideas for gags. Additional ideas for one-liners, for jokes, but also for sight gags. Because your, your unconscious mind is kind of working on this other level while you're drawing out, like doodling ideas for it. And you can kind of tap into this like sort of Jungian unconscious thing um, while you're while you're writing it. And I found that that to be incredibly helpful. One discussion I had with Nathan Kane, with the editor, um, who uh, while while I was developing the story, and Nathan himself uh, writes and draws certain stories for uh, for Bongo. I think he was one of the artists on this cover, in fact, and. Um, so because of that, he has a really good sense of story and character development and plot, and um, he has really good instincts for this kind of stuff. And we, were t we went back and forth on what the gremlins should look like before we came to the conclusion that they should look like Bart. At first, my initial idea was that they should be the Happy Little Elves. Does anyone know the Happy Little Elves characters that Maggie Simpsons is obsessed with? They're like parodies of the Smurfs. And I had drawn some thumbnail sketches I was very excited about, where it was like the Happy Little Elves with these giant fangs, and they looked really disturbing, and they're like latched onto a poo like little leeches. And it was like really freaky. And I was like, well, let's do that story. And then Nathan's like, I don't know. Let's have, can we brainstorm like other ideas for what the, what the gremlins should look like? And I gave him this list and it was either the Bart gremlins from Sim Simpsorama, which is what these are. Simpsorama being the Simpsons and Futurama crossover episode of the TV series. It was either that or the gremlin from the Nightmare at 20,000 Feet Twilight Zone parody, um, which was an episode of the Trios of Art TV show. Um, I think there were a couple of others. Oh, I think one of them was going to be Mo Gremlins. They look like Mo Sislak because he looks kind of like a gremlin anyway. Um, and I was excited about that idea. I did another story, a Bartman comic, uh, like a year or two ago for, for Bongo Comics. This is Bongo Comics, by the way. is Matt Groening's comic book company. He's the creator of The Simpsons. He's the publisher of Bongo. And um, I, did, I did a story, a Bartman story for them like a year or two ago. And... It had Bartman standing on a gargoyle, like one of the gargoyles that jut out of a skyscraper of a building, and the gargoyle is Mo. And um, that's in the script. That kind of that's the kind of detail you can put into a comic book script. That's that's part of the fun of writing comics. You can actually get that detailed quite a bit. I found with TV scripts, which is is part of the fun of television as well. Um, and. Well, we decided to go with the Simpsorama Bart Gremlins, obviously, and I think they work really well in the story. They really communicate the story on a couple different levels. For one thing, um, Bart, in, in the normal Bart, not the Gremlin Bart, menaces Apu uh, on a pretty regular basis anyway, and so having the Bart Gremlins menace Apu definitely works really well. There's a nice sort of symmetry to it. And also just kind of communicates the story really well. They look like parodies of the Gremlins in the 1984 movie Gremlins, so it works. And within the story itself, um, you know, you first see them in Mogwai form. Um, Apu is working the graveyard shift at Quickie Mart. The story is called, if I haven't said it already, the story is called Graveyard Shift. He's waiting for his brother Sanjay to relieve him at like 5 in the morning or whatever because, you know, he's working all night like he normally does on the show and in the comics. And um, I should also mention, this is not an adaptation of, a, of an episode of the Trios of Horror TV, Horror TV show. This is an all original story. The Trios of Horror comics are completely original and separate from the Trios of Horror TV show. They're all different stories. I'm not saying one's better than the other. I think they're just, they're different stories. Um, they're not like, one is not adaptation of the other. And um, so Apu, like the UPS guy leaves up who this this box of gremlins uh, that were supposed to be sent to the Bewitchy Mart, the sorcery shop down the road, but instead they're accidentally sent to the Quickie Mart. Um, you know, I get packages sent to me all the time, mistakenly, so I figured it probably happens to Apu. And it's a good excuse for him getting the gremlins. And he does because he's a workaholic and he doesn't want to abandon his post. And Apu is all about like duty. You know, he's all about he's he's kind of. Um, 
He's all about fulfilling his duty and everything, and he's all about being a workaholic and working way too hard. And so I figured it was in character for him to just keep the gremlins around as long as they're harmless mogwais, and what's the worst that could happen? And it kind of plays on the fact that, like, that stereotype that you see in a lot of horror movies, where the protagonist is like, what's the worst that could happen? What could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? And of course he doesn't read the warning on the box of, of gremlins that says, don't feed them squishies after midnight. And he feeds them squishies after midnight, and they become, you know, horrible, bloodthirsty uh, bark gremlins. A character from the TV show dies horribly. The fun thing about writing Trials of Our Stories is they're also, they're, they don't take place within the normal Sim Simpsons continuity, so you can kill off characters um, and then have them magically appear in the next episode of the show or issue of the comic. Um, know, should I spoil which character dies? Should I tell you which? I don't know if you can buy this issue anymore, but I, maybe during the Q&A, if you, if you like, I can spoil it. But it is, it is a fun reveal. Um, and I have, you know, Chief Wiggum appears in the story, Homer appears in the story, Snake appears in the story, so a number of Simpsons characters appear in the story. But I had a lot of fun having, especially in those first few pages, having Apu just like be alone by himself um, at late at night and kind of establishing the mood and very creepy mood with all these shadows playing against it. And, you know, for that reason, I definitely had to storyboard at least those first few pages. I had to draw thumbnail sketches out for those and also definitely had to um, like sort of play around with like how little dialogue can we have because you just got a guy talking to himself for a couple pages and that can be death. That can like sound really artificial and phony and like writer's handy. So you don't want that to happen. So I had to play around with that a lot. So you know, sometimes he's talking to whoever wanders in late at night. Sometimes he's talking to the gremlins themselves. You have to figure out like why is this guy talking to himself? You know what I mean? How can I make that not sound phony? Um, you know, and, uh, but I, th I think I pulled it off. I became really obsessed while writing this one and while writing the Sailor Steve Costigan story. I became obsessed with rereading a lot of pulp fiction stories from the 30s and 40s, a lot of pulp magazine stories and pulp novels, um, because Robert E. Howard was a pulp writer, for those who don't know. And I became kind of like re-addicted to these stories that I hadn't read in a while. Um, there's this TV show from the 60s called Thriller, which was on for like two seasons in the early 60s. It's like Tales from the Crypt or Twilight Zone, but it's, it's, all, it's all horror. They're all like horror and crime stories. It was narrated, it was hosted by Boris Karloff, who's an actor in the 30s and 40s. By the 60s, he'd become this very familiar presence on television, and he hosted this show, Thriller. And some of the shows were adaptations of pulp horror stories from the 30s and 40s, some of the episodes of Thriller, including this, this really excellent episode called Masquerade, which is this vampire comedy episode of Thriller, and that tonally was a big influence on this episode, uh, on this issue of Treehouse of Horror, the story that I wrote. I just wrote the cover story, I should say that, The Graveyard Shift. The other two stories um, in the episode, one of them is a parody of Left Behind, and the other one is a parody of Metropolis, the movie Metropolis. And I did not write those two stories. Those are also very excellent stories. They're all, um, the artists and writers on those stories are really good. And I, I, think, I think it's generally a really solid episode. And this is Five Minute Avengers Stories, which, oh yeah, I actually have some of these that I can hold up and show all of you. And I, you know what, yeah, um, I have all of these, yeah. And I can, I can talk more about them during the Q&A if you like. But um, Five Minute Avengers Stories, here it is. It is, hopefully I didn't just cut the mic, oh good. Um, but it's a collection of 12 prose fiction stories for kids, it says ages three and up, so it's very young children. I have a daughter who's about to turn five. As we're recording this, um, if you watch this like on YouTube later, she'll be like 20 or what, I don't know. Um, but as of this day in the year of our Lord, October 26th to 2015, um, she is four years old. Anyway, um, so it's really fun. It's really fun for those of you in the audience who are parents or who hope to be one or who are parents and don't know it yet because you're not on Mori Povich. I don't know. Um, <laughs> You'll find out you are not the father. Um, fun show. When did it become all paternity tests? That's what I'm wondering. That's, like, that's every episode these days. Um, anyway, uh, Five Minute Avengers Stories, it's a collection of prose fiction stories. There are 12 of them. I wrote three. So if you do the math, that's a quarter of the stories. Um, it, was, it was so much fun writing these because they're you know, stories featuring the various Marvel superheroes from the Avengers comics and the Avengers movies. Um, but on a, on a kid level, I'd certainly be happy to write them on an adult level, too, because they're just great characters in general. But it's definitely really fun writing the, the, uh, 
this sort of young reader's version of, of these characters. Um, and one of the stories, Practice Makes Perfect, is a, an Iron Man story. Another one, Lending a Wing, is a Falcon story. It's the, fa the character of the Falcon, although um, Captain America and Black Widow play a pretty large role in that story as well. And the third one, Robin Hawk, is a Hawkeye story, although, again, a couple of the other characters from the Marvel Universe, um, Iron Man and MODOK, play a pretty big role in that story. I, sh I should talk about that story in particular, by the way. Uh, two things about a, a Five Minute Avengers stories. One, I, I had a very weird twit trick uh, get that I used to get into character to write the Iron Man story, which was I had a really hard time. At first, I was like, how do I get into the... I'm not a billionaire. I don't know if you can tell by the suit, but I'm not a billionaire like Tony Stark is. I think it's an okay suit, but, but come on, Tony Stark can, can afford to like, you know, murder that lion and turn his pelt into a suit for me. Uh, that just made Tony Stark sound like a terrible person, which he isn't, uh, which he is not. Um, but, you know, because of the fact that Tony Stark's a billionaire and that he's this big inventor and he's this, and I barely passed like junior high science, you know, um, how do I relate to this character? And I thought, well, I mean, not to toot my own horn, I am also often the smartest person in the room, so there's, there's that. But um, is he kidding? I don't know. Is he? Maybe he's, maybe he's just kidding. I don't know. Is he that much of a, an egomaniac? Is he serious? Um, that will be up for you to judge, audience. Um, but I, I found an interesting technique of getting into character to write this story. I found, first of all, it, it is true that when you are a professional writer, and specifically when you're a comedy writer, and when you're, I don't know, you use big words. I had like on World's Dumbest, there was one of the producers who shall remain nameless, who was like, whenever he disagreed with me, he was like, Ari, I get it. I know you're brilliant, but you're wrong about this. You know what I mean? And I didn't understand why he, why he would say that. And then the head writer of the show was one time, he was like, which, which Ivy League school did you go to, Harvard or Yale? And I was like, I went to NYU, dude. It's not a hard Ivy League at all. But I realized it's because I use big words and I come across a certain way. And I think Tony Stark has that same thing, where people have certain preconceptions about him. The other thing about Tony Stark that I realized that I, that I could relate to is like, when he's, he's again, like Apu, he's this workaholic. And that's kind of what... That was kind of the stem for both of those characters for me, for how I related to them. Because, you know, Apu is usually not the comic relief on The Simpsons. He's usually the straight man, and then they usually pair him up with Homer for very Apu-centric episodes. And Homer's the bumbling idiot, and Apu's the straight man who's like the voice of reason. He's like the Jiminy Cricket in those stories. Well, in Tony Stark, um, in, in terms of Tony Stark, I also, and, and also Apu, the fact that they were these workaholics is something I could definitely relate to. And the fact that, like, with Tony, you know, he, he works on problems that he's going through in his life by, like, tinkering and working. He, like, plunges himself into the work, and that's how he solves problems. And I was like, I can relate to that. And so I put on a shirt that was, like, the shirt, the, like, black T-shirt that, that Robert Downey Jr. wears in the, in the Iron Man movies. And I just, like, pretended, like, I'm, I'm, I'm Tony Stark. I'm, like, working on some brilliant invention. And I just sat at my laptop and cranked out the story, like, downloaded a copy of the script to one of the Iron Man movies, and, like just read some passages from it and sort of got into character as Tony and thought like, I'm him, that's how I'm gonna play this. You know what I mean? And that's how I'm gonna get into character to write it. Um, with Robin Hawk, which is the Hawkeye story, it's that Hawkeye, Iron Man, and MODOK all go into, back in time into the Middle Ages in medieval Europe uh, where Iron Man is mistaken for a knight, MODOK is mistaken for an ogre, and Hawkeye, is the start of the story, is mistaken for Robin Hood, the legendary archer Robin Hood, because he's, he's an archer and he's dressed in this colorful outfit and he helps the helpless. Of course you're Robin Hood, the villagers tell him, and he can't convince them otherwise. And I, I love time travel stories like that. I love fish out of water, sci-fi stories like that. I had a lot of fun with it. And because of that, um, the editors liked it so much that I also wrote, they, they also had me write a um, Spider-Man story where Spider-Man travels back to the Old West, which is going to appear in a Spider-Man storybook collection that comes out in May. 2016. And, and if anyone wants a card, I do these kinds of talks all over the world. These days, if anyone wants to keep in touch or talk to me about that, I have these cards with all my info. Thank you all very, very much.